Hey there, in this video, we're talking about operator overloading and aggregation in C++ object-oriented programming. And this covers sections 14.5 to 14.7 in the Gattis textbook. And this video is mostly about the operator overloading issue. And boy, the first time I saw this in C++, I was just so excited about it. It just seemed like the niftiest feature ever. It gives you so much power as a C++ programmer here. And let's just think about what that means. So operators are symbols like plus or minus or times in C++. And overloading, we've seen that term before from semester one, means letting functions of the same name do different jobs, reusing the same function name to do various different jobs. So you see, you can do that same kind of thing with any symbolic operator, like plus, minus, times, divide, whatever, you, the C++ programmer, can take control of that and make it do whatever you want. It's so fascinating. Not all languages have this, as a matter of fact, so it's kind of a feature that makes C++ stand out, and um, I, I still think this is really nifty. Okay, so operator overloading. In C++, symbolic operators can be overloaded to do new custom jobs with new classes of objects. And again, some examples of operators here, plus, minus, times, divide, uh, the equals sign, relational operators like less than or greater than, the increment decrement operators, the insertion extraction arrows, the array subscript brackets. You can take control of all that stuff and make it do whatever you like. A um, couple of examples that we've used all along from the C++ string class, if you think back to how this worked. The, the relations like lesser than as well as greater than and so forth, they're overloaded to do textual dictionary ordering for strings. And uh, my students actually had to use this when we did programming challenge 8.6, the string selection sort previously. It was really, really handy that if I have string object one and string object two, I can just put down string one less than string two, and it returns true or false based on what order they come in the dictionary. Now that's very different from comparing like integers or floats because it has to look at a whole bunch of separate characters to figure out what the ordering is. Totally different job being done with that lesser than sign. And that made that assignment very, very simple actually because you could just use the exact same sorting code that you do normally and just rely on that, le that same lesser than symbol to do the right job, even though it's totally different. Or again, talking about C++ string objects, the plus sign is overloaded to do concatenation. If I do string one plus string two, it just glues those strings together, right? Again, a very different job from adding integers or floats. It glues them together, we call concatenation. So there's a couple of good examples that's made our lives much, much easier in C++ that the operators can be overloaded to do some kind of natural, obvious job that we want. And again, save us a whole lot of typing time and just be very readable and very clear and very short in our code. So this is a feature that's in C++, but it is not allowed. It's not permitted in some other languages. For example, C does not have this. Java does not have this. So it's something that's just a little bit special to the C++ language. Again, you know, some other examples I can think of is a lot of math stuff, actually. If I have a complex number class, I want to be able to add those things, multiply those things. If I have a matrix class, Right? You can add matrices, you can multiply matrices, but it works very differently from adding or subtracting integers. It looks, works totally differently. So if you're making one of those exotic advanced number classes, you're going to want to take advantage of the operator overloading. So I can just put down complex number one plus complex number two and do the job that you need to do or multiply them or multiply matrices, right? So it's definitely the kind of thing that you would want to do so you can write down your code just like you would see it in math if you're adding or multiplying, say, complex numbers or matrices. So definitely something you'd want to do there to make your math look like your code. Okay, so first example, overloading the assignment operator. So let's say you want to take control of the assignment operator for your class and make it do some kind of custom job. Here's what the prototype's going to look like. So the little secret here is all your operators are really functions. All your operators, plus, times, minus, whatever, they're actually really functions. And the name of the function is literally operator, whatever the symbol is. 
So if I want to take control of the assignment operator, I'm actually making a function called operator equals. That's the whole name of it, actually, operator equals. So in this case, I'm making operator equals with a return type of void, and it's going to take one single reference parameter of the same class. So each of these different operators is going to have a particular different type or number of parameters. And if you think about just how equals works, I write one receiving object on the left of the equal sign, okay. And what goes on the other side of the equal sign has to be just one single thing, one single object of the same class. So at least for the equals operator specifically, it only takes one single parameter. And that parameter is going to be same kind of thing, reference so that you save time uh, sending it into this function, constant because you shouldn't be changing the thing that you're copying from. So that's how that works here. And so once you set this up and give it whatever code you want to do, it could actually just copy all the stuff identically. It could modify it. I mean, I don't know, maybe you want to like double it as you bring this into a new object, perhaps something like that. So whatever you do, once you implement it, you can call it just like this. You can call object one equals object two. And what that's really doing is it's doing object one dot function operator equals and passing in object two. So notice that when you wrote it the short way, and I'm sure that I would write it the short way here, this is the whole point of this, the object on the left, that's the object that you're calling this function on. You're actually working inside object one. And the object on the right, that's what you're passing in as the parameter to this function call. And if you look up above, you see here, we actually named that incoming parameter rval for the right-hand value, the right-hand value on this equal sign right here. That's what's getting passed into this function call, and that's why we called it that. So frequently, um, when we're setting up these kinds of uh, overloaded operator functions, we're gonna call the incoming argument something like rval or rightval, because that's actually where it shows up when you write down the actual operator. Uh, so again, you might want to take your, your, your page of notes, and I would probably write down this very clearly because this is new, and you want to remind yourself that the equal operator takes one parameter, constant reference to the same kind of object. Now, you can change uh, the, the return type, actually. So on this particular slide, uh, as an example, we made it a void return type. Um, you know, it might actually be better to return the same kind of object. Like in this case, it might be better to return a sum class object, uh, I guess the one that you're actually inside of. And if you remember from the last video, you could use the this pointer to do that. You could do your work in here and then return a dereference to this, and you actually are returning a copy of the object that you're inside of. And so that actually might be better to have the return type be some class, because then you could chain up your equal signs. If you've seen that before in C++, you can write a equals B equals C equals D. And in order for that to work, the assignments have to be returning another object of the same type. So you take D, you assign it to C, that equal sign returns the C object, and that's actually how you're able to assign that into B. That returns an object, and that's how you assign it into A, as a matter of fact. So uh, doing that would allow you to chain assignments together. That'd probably be better. Um, and you can see there is an example in the book where they do that. That's a good idea. Okay, anyway, that's just our first example. Just our first example of overloading the assignment operator. And not the most interesting thing, because, I mean, again, there's the default copy constructor we talked about in the last video, that that will just happen automatically, frankly. I don't think I need to do this a lot, but if you need to, you can take control of the equals assignment operator, right? And technically, it's really a function called operator equals. Let's look at some more interesting things. Okay, overloading the arithmetic operators. So arithmetic operators are commonly overloaded, like plus, minus, times, divide. And again, I'm thinking about, I'm making a complex number class. I wanna do their specialized add multiply jobs. I'm making a matrix, matrix class, I want the same thing. When we go back and we look at that feet inches measurement class we talked about last time, same thing. We'll wanna be able to add or subtract those feet inches objects in reasonable ways. So uh, we're taking control of these operators for that. Kind of like assignment, when you implement these, kind of like assignment, it's called, right? again, you're gonna really have functions called operator plus or operator minus or whatever. 
And so when you use that, they're actually being called on the left side object operand, and you're passing in as a parameter the right side object operand as a constant reference parameter. So again, if I write down object one plus object two, you're really calling a function object one dot operator plus argument object two is what's happening. So very, very similar to that assignment example. Now, usually, this, this case is even more uh, common, usually going to return an object of the same type. So if I add two integers, I got to return back a result that's an integer. If I, uh, if I uh, multiply two complex numbers, I ought to return a value that's another complex number. It's kind of the sensible thing to do. That's how that works. So how are we going to make this happen? So probably the best strategy is to make a temporary object of the same type inside your function you're implementing, manipulating that temporary object to the desired effect and then returning that. So think about this. When you add two operands, right, you don't want to change the original object. If I write down a equals 1 plus 2, adding 1 plus 2 does not change the 1. It does not change the 2. What it's doing is producing a new number, namely 3, and storing that in the variable a. So I definitely don't want to change the original objects, but I want to make a new object with a new value and return that. All right. So here, as we continue to expand the feet inches example from last time, remember feet inches is a class to store measurements in feet and inches in the imperial system. And it's got two members. It's got the feet number, and it's also got the inches number. And again, there's 12 inches per foot. The number for inches shouldn't go over, shouldn't go up to 12 or more. That should be another foot. So here, we're making an adding operator, we're overloading the adding operator specifically for feet inches. So the name of the function is feet inches scope resolution operator plus. So we're working inside the feet inches class. The name of the function is operator plus. Doesn't matter if there's a space here or not. Some people do it one way or the other. Totally doesn't matter. But the name of the function is operator plus. And like we said, we're passing in an argument of the same type. So a feet inches reference, make it constant because you don't need to change that. Don't change the operands that you're adding. Uh, remember calling it right because when you write this down, whatever is to the right of the plus sign is really getting sent in as the parameter here going to return at the end, we're going to produce a new feet inches object and return that. So here we are making, as we said, a temporary feet inches object for the result, calling it temp, or you could say result or whatever you want to call it. And we're setting the number of inches. Remember, there's a feet inch, there's a feet member, there's an inches member. So we're setting the number of inches in this temp to the inches in my object that I'm inside of, right? That's really the left operand of the plus sign and adding it to the number of inches in this right object, right? So setting that sum to the inches in my new object, and then also taking the feet in the object that I'm currently inside of, again, the left-hand operand, adding it to the number of feet in this right-hand object, right? Taking that result and setting it in temp.feet. And then one other thing, I don't know if you're gonna guess this or not, we're calling a private member function in feet inches called simplify. We're calling temp.simplify. What is that gonna do? Well, basically, if the number of inches goes over 12, it does the carry job. It carries the extra inches into the feet member. We're gonna see that on the next slide. Anyway, it does what you need to do, and then once you've got this temp object with the result, you return temp. And that is the return type here, feet inches. That's a good example of that. Okay, so again, in comes the right-hand operand, make a temporary object, do what you need to do, and then return that. And that's probably how you're gonna set up any one of those arithmetic operators. But let's look at this simplify uh, function here to make sure we see what's happening there. So this is, if you look at the header file in the book code for this, this is a private member function. This is not a job that the application programmers need to worry about. The class programmer has set this up, and what they're gonna do is internally Every single arithmetic operator is going to call this at the end of the function, just like our operator plus does. Do some kind of manipulation, call this at the end to make sure that your feet inches object doesn't have inches over 12. So here's this private function called simplify. So you're basically just looking at the number of inches. If the number of inches in your object is greater than or equal to 12, okay, so what you really ought to do is carry that into the next foot. And I mean, depending on how this worked, 
maybe the, the number of inches might be as high as like 20 or 30 or something like that. So what they're gonna do is they're gonna take inches, divide by 12, that's really the number of feet that it should have been, take that number of feet and add it into the feet member. Okay, that makes sense. But then you have to cut down the number of inches and what you do is inches mod 12, right? That's the remainder having divided, divided it by 12. So whatever is left over, that's the new number of inches. Lovely, great, isn't that clever? And then this else part here is going in the other direction is if you were subtracting two of these things and the number of inches went negative on you, now this does the borrow job. Now you have to borrow from the feet. You gotta reduce the feet by one and then you bring that 12 inches into your inches to solve that problem. You can kind of think about what the exact math is, but basically this does the borrow job if your inches went negative on you. Uh, great, but for the for the adding uh, job that we were just looking at, you'd only be ever triggering this first part of maybe inches went over 12, and then you have to do your carry job. That's nice. Now again, that's built in to the feet inches object. Once Alice, the class programmer, made this, this is happening automatically under the hood. Nobody even knows that this is happening, but it's just happening anyway. The class, the application programmers don't have to worry about it never have to look at this. Maybe they don't even never think that this is happening and therefore they make this function private so that it marks that they don't have to worry about it. Okay, so let's test this first version of the feet inches class that we're starting with. And you can see here, I have pulled up the feet inches version one out of the lecture code for chapter 14 here. Um, and I've, uh, since it's a multi-file project, I've made a dev C++ project called it test feet inches here, you can see that. Put all of the source code files in the project. So I've got feetinches.h, feetinches.cpp, and this application test file as well. So let's just kind of briefly look at this. Uh, at this point, we kind of know what this is gonna look like. Here's the definition of the feet inches class. And again, it's got a feet member. It's got an inches member, like we said. And there's that private simplify function that's always doing the carry or the borrow whenever that needs to happen, if inches goes over 12 or below zero, actually. You have a constructor that takes the two numbers and sets it up like you would expect. You have mutators to set the feet and to set the inches as you would expect. Got some accessors here. Now notice with, with these functions, the way it's set up is any function that changes the number of inches specifically, they're calling simplify at the end of the constructor they're calling at the end of this mutator here. So anytime the inches change and might go over 12, the class programmer Alice is committing to calling simplify before you get done with that function to make sure the inches is always between zero and 11 actually. Now at the bottom here, here are our overloaded um, arithmetic operators to start with. And you can see they've got operator plus overloaded. They also have operator minus overloaded, both of those things, fairly similar internally. Um, we can look at what the code is for that stuff over in feedinches.cpp, and we've seen this. So here is the private simplify function. Don't need to talk about that anymore. Here is the operator plus function, okay? And then here comes the operator minus function they also have. Very, very similar to that, uh, that plus function there. So hopefully you can kind of see what that's working like. So change this, so do the subtraction between the two objects, and again, call simplify right before the function is over. But um, that's all Alice's job, right? I'm just gonna assume that that's set up properly. Uh, so now I'm thinking like an application programmer like Bob, and I'm seeing what did Bob have to do to test this class? So um, over here in PR 14.8, got two integer variables to hold input coming in. The user will be specifying a number of feet and number of inches here, not too surprising. Now here in line 13, we're declaring three objects of type feet inches. So there's first, there's second, there's third. Um, so three feet inches objects. And of course that line calls the default constructor. And I think what we saw in the default constructor just sets feet and inches to zero in all those right now. And then here we're getting input for the first object. So asking the user to enter a distance in feet and inches, right, get those two numbers, call first.set feet with that number, call first.set inches with the inches number. Okay, so just input for the first object. And then here, we're getting input from the user for the second object. So again, enter a, a number of feet and number of inches, take those variables, pass it into the second feet inches measurement object. 
Okay, but here comes the interesting stuff. So all you could guess all that. Here comes the interesting stuff. Is what do I want to do when I want to add? I want to add two of these feet inches objects. Here's all you got to do. You just write down first plus second. Done. That's it. Right. That's what you want the operator overloading for. So from Bob's perspective, he doesn't even have to know about the number of feet. He doesn't have to know about the number of inches. He doesn't have to handle that separately. He doesn't have to deal with the simplifying deal if the inches goes over 12. He literally just writes down first plus second, that's it, the end. And you, of course, when that happens, you really jump into the operator plus, you do that job, you do the fix up with the simplify, return the result, and you store it in third. That's it, that's all you want. So see how, how on that particular line, see how short and clean and easy to read that is? It's literally just first plus second, the end, does the job. And then we're gonna get some display here so we can confirm that it's working right. So you take that third, which is holding the result. Like personally, I might've called that like result myself. So print out third dot get feet, print out third dot get inches. Okay, and now we're gonna test the subtraction operator. So here we are in line 40, see how simple that is? You wanna subtract two feet inches measurements. You just write down first minus second. That's it, first minus second, the end. Right, that's all the application programmer needs to worry about. You jump, really, that jumps into operator minus, it adds the feet, it, adds, it subtracts the feet, subtracts the inches, simplifies, normalizes, returns it. But for the application programmer, so simple, they just see first minus second, that's it. You put the result in third, and then you print that out. Great. So uh, let's compile this business. Let's confirm that it actually works. And you can see we're getting a whole bunch of files here, of course with this multi-file project. So let's try that. Again, we're gonna be entering two of these fit inches measurement objects. So for the first one, let's say I've got uh, five foot seven for the first one, and I've got three foot two for the second one. Great. So when you add these, you do get eight feet and nine inches. That looks correct to me. And when you subtract these, you're gonna get two feet and five inches. So it looks like that's working correct for you. Now, fairly simple because there was no carry or borrow in that particular case. So I definitely want to test those two cases as well. Let's try that. So let's say my first measurement is six foot nine and my second measurement is two foot five. Interesting. So you see, when you, if you just add the number of feet, six and two add up to eight, but nine and 15 add up to 14 inches, which is more than a foot. So they reduce that, right? 14 inches is really one foot, one extra foot with two inches left over. So they added the extra foot into the eight and now you have nine feet and two inches left over and that looks correct to me. Now in this case, the subtraction is still pretty simple because you're gonna get uh, four feet and four inches as a matter of fact, so great. So the carry job, remember that's being done in that simplify function done automatically and the application programmer did not have to do any extra work for that to happen. It's just built in to operator plus right there. But let's, let's make sure that the, the subtraction also works. So I'll run this a third time. And let's say my measurements are eight foot one and three foot three. Okay, so the addition is easy. Eight and three is 11 and one plus three is four inches. That's easy. But in the subtraction case, right, they had to borrow. Eight minus three is actually five feet, but you can't subtract one minus three. They had to borrow a foot from the eight, make that seven, take the 12 inches, add it to the one for 13. Then you can legitimately subtract 13 minus three for 10 inches. And for the feet, you gotta do seven minus three for four feet. So that, does, that is also actually correct. Great. So how neat is that? Again, from the application programmers, perspective, right? That was quite a bit of stuff we just talked about. They don't have to worry about any of that. It's all handled automatically by the object-oriented programming by this overloaded subtraction operator that does the job, including calling simplify to do the borrow job automatically. And for Bob, the application programmer, so simple, it's lovely. Great. Now, you know, we can think about expanding to, you know, multiplying and dividing maybe if that makes sense. One thing I see in this code is there's a little bit of repetitive code. When we're printing it out, they're doing like, here's a number, you know, get feet, the feet, comma, get inches, get the inches. So actually maybe an additional improvement we could make 
is make a member function that automatically does that printing job, maybe would make our lives easier. So we can consider a, a number of continued expansions on this, and the book does actually go through those improvements. So we should look for that. Okay, so uh, yeah, so arithmetic operators like uh, plus minus times divide work like we saw there. Now, let's talk about something else. It's gonna work kind of differently. Overloading the increment and decrement operators. So we commonly do this. The increment and the decrement operators can be overloaded. Of course, that's the plus plus and the minus minus. Now think about how this is different. Um, the operators plus minus times, they're binary operators. We are adding two things, you're subtracting two things. That's the nature of those operators. These operators only work on a single variable. Therefore, we're not gonna need to pass in a right-hand parameter to them, right? No parameter needed for these. Other thing that's different here is that whereas plus or minus or divide don't change the operands, they produce some third new result, but they don't change the original operands. Of course, the increment decrement operators do change the operand. The whole point of them is they do change the variable that they're stuck on. So that's a big difference there. Plus there's only one thing here. Uh, okay, so hopefully that makes sense. It might be a little bit easier in one sense because there's only one operand happening. But the thing that we do have to be careful about here is remember there's a difference between prefix and postfix notation. So if you put the plus plus down before your variable in prefix notation, that means that you're supposed to change the variable first and then do the rest of the statement that it's embedded in. But if you put the plus plus after your variable, that's postfix notation, and that's saying you're supposed to do all the rest of the statement that it's embedded in first and then do the plus plus as the very last thing. Okay, so two separate things, and we are gonna have to actually make two separate functions to handle those two separate cases. So kind of be careful about that. How are we gonna do that? Okay, let's deal with the prefix notation first where the plus plus or whatever operation is supposed to happen first before the rest of the statement. This is gonna be somewhat easier is for prefix notation, you should just make the change immediately and return that result. And then the result can be used by the rest of the surrounding statement. That's very, very simple. It's the postfix notation that gonna, we're gonna have to get a little bit more clever with, but the prefix notation shouldn't be too bad. Just make the change immediately, return the current object. Okay, so simple. So here we're overloading the prefix plus plus operator, the prefix increment operator for the feet inches object. And what you're gonna do here, it seems like the sensible thing here is just add one inch, just to increment the inches, that's it. And then we're gonna return the incremented object. So I'm in the feet inches class. The name of this operator is operator plus plus. It does not take any parameters because you're just adjusting one single variable, the object you're inside of. And so what makes sense here is just increment the number of inches. And then don't forget, you might have gone up to 12 at this point, which is kind of too much. Call the simplify private member function to fix that if it went over 12. And then once you do that adjustment, return a dereference to this. Remember again that this pointer that's in every single member function when you want to use it, it's built in automatically. We saw that in the prior video. So here, this is again talking about the object that you're inside of right now. So why not just dereference this and that's your return value to feed inches. And then whatever larger statement this plus plus was embedded in, you're returning the modified feed inches object and the rest of the statement gets to use that. Great. Now notice, I, I guess one, I guess counterintuitive thing, I guess see some be, I see some beginning students do is they kind of want to increment everything in the entire class. They want to increment feet as well. But it, it kind of, I wouldn't want to take like a, a two foot six measurement, do plus plus to it, and then get three foot seven inches. I don't know why anybody would ever do that. So the point here, the idea of the increment is just add the smallest possible unit. So it would make sense, I think here to just increment just add one inch, right? That's the smallest possible increase you can make in a feet inches measurement. So that's all we're doing here. Not modifying every single member, just with the smallest one. And then I'm glad that, I'm glad that we have that simplify uh, function available, again, as a, as a private member, so we can just call that and automatically fix it up if it goes over 12. Great. Okay, very simple. Again, that's prefix notation where you do want the object to be modified to start with. Simple. Now, 
The tricky thing, or the little bit of a magic trick we're going to have to do here, is what do you do for postfix increment and decrement? Now, first of all, how do we distinguish in our function? See, we just saw operator plus plus. So how do we distinguish a postfix increment or decrement call as opposed to what we just saw? And here's how C++ does that. The function call for postfix call, passes a dummy, an extra integer variable, as an argument so that the compiler can distinguish the overloaded call. Now, it's a little bit weird that that's what C++ does because this incoming parameter is just going to be ignored in the function. It will not be used. Uh, but it, the only reason that incoming parameter is there is just to be different from the prefix function call, which took no parameter, right? That's how overloading functions work, right? You can only distinguish them with different parameter lists. So the prefix call takes no parameter, but the postfix call does take one integer argument and then just gets ignored. Kind of weird. I don't know if there's another way to do that, but that's how C++ did it. Now, second question, how do we make this function appear to happen after the surrounding statement when it's really not? See, this will get, these, all your functions will get called first before other operators or things in a big statement. So how do we make it look like it's happening last when it's really not? So here's a little magic trick we do. We're gonna make a copy of the initial state of the object that you're in. We're gonna modify that copy as desired, but we're gonna return the initial copy. Okay, so make a copy of the initial state, modify the existing object that you're inside of, however you want, return the initial copy. So the rest of the statement that you're on is actually seeing a return value of what this object started out as. Even though the object has been changed, the rest of the surrounding statement doesn't see that. And that's how we do this little illusion of making it look like it's changing later when it's actually not. Super clever, super clever. Let's see, let's see the specifics of that. So here is the postfix increment function for the feet inches class. So our overloaded postfix plus plus operator. So again, the name of the function is feet inches scope resolution operator plus plus. You see how this is different? It does take one integer argument, right? That's how it tells the difference between this and prefix. Now notice we didn't even bother to give it a name. The incoming integer argument, we didn't even bother to name it because we don't need to use it. Therefore, you don't even need a name for it, okay? But here's an incoming argument, whatever the integer is, to tell the difference between postfix and prefix. So you come in here, and just like we said, here we're making a copy of the original state, right? I'm in this object, it's got a number of feet, it's got a number of inches, so I'm making a new feet inches object called temp, being initialized to the current feet and the current inches of the object that I'm inside of. Now, we're not gonna change that. See, that's the return value down on 82. We're just gonna, re we're gonna return that unchanged copy of this object. So the rest of the surrounding statement sees that, works with the original copy. But in the meantime, we are gonna increment the number of inches in this object, in the this object. We're gonna simplify it like we normally do. So this object has been changed with one extra inch, but you're returning the initial original copy so whatever statement this is embedded in just sees the original version and works with that. So that's what that's that's the little bit of illusion to make it look like we want postfix notation to happen. So you can kind of think about that. Clever. Okay. So we've seen, you know, in this video here we've seen overloading the assignment operator to begin with. We talked about overloading arithmetic operators like we we saw the details of plus, but you know, plus minus times divide, they all they're all going to work the same. Right, take one parameter for the right-hand operand, do what you want to. We've seen increment decrement operators, both in prefix form and postfix form. But there's so many other options. Um, almost any other operator in C++ can be overloaded to do custom jobs. Um, and so the, the book goes into great detail, goes through all these different examples of the syntax for any one of these different categories. And again, they're going to have a different number of arguments. They're going to have different expected return values. So it might be a good idea to look at the book and see all those different formats for all these different operators. Again, arithmetic operators, they're binary, right? You're calling it on one, you're passing another argument. Increment decrement operators, at least for prefix, only have one, right? You're calling it on one object, you don't need any parameter. 
except for the postfix stuff, just to tell it that it's postfix. Now you think about relational operators like equals or lesser or greater, et cetera, et cetera. See, they do work on two things. So you're gonna call it on one object. You are gonna pass in a right-hand parameter, but then you need to return a Boolean. You're gonna return either true or false about whether this was less or greater or whatever, right? Which is different from arithmetic where you're passing back an object of the same type. Relational operators pass back a Boolean for a return value. Of course they do. You can overload the insertion extraction operators. So the double left-hand angle brackets that does insertion to like a count statement or a file and the double right-hand angle brackets that does extraction from a sin statement or an input file, right? You can overload those. So if you have a class, right? If you have a class like this feet inches, you can automatically get a feet inches out of a sin object and you can automatically print the whole feet inches object to an output file, as a matter of fact, that would be really that would be really interesting to do. They do that in the expanded code, so you might want to look at that in the feet inches example in the book. It'd be interesting. You can overload the subscript symbol for square brackets. You can make a class that pretends that it's an array. So you can make a class that maybe maintains several pieces of data, and you can access it with the subscript symbol just like you do an array, even though it's not. That seems great. So basically, you would need to look up the details of any one of those things because they all work kind of differently. The only things you cannot overload in C++ are these symbols. You can't overload the ternary operator, question mark colon, you know, partly because it's three things and it doesn't fit the format of any of the other things we looked at. The period for member access in a struct or a class, that's like so fundamental to how structs and objects work, you can't overload that. There is a combined operator uh, dot star together that does member access for pointers. You can't overload that. The scope resolution operator, that's baked in. You can't change that. And the size of operator that gets the size of a structure or an object or something like that, that's fixed. You're not allowed to change that. So C++ kinds of needs, need to depend on these super important things and those you can't overload. But all the other symbols, you can make do whatever you want. Super powerful super powerful in C++. So I like that that's there very much. Again, lots of details in the book that you can check out if you need that, but we've we've spotted the most important things. I think you've got a good taste for it at this point. Okay, so the other thing we wanna talk about in this video at the end of chapter 14 is aggregation. Some people call this composition. So aggregation is when a class is a member of another class, right? Any piece of data, you can make a member variable of a class, including other classes, why not? So, um, you know, conceptually, grammatically, this supports the modeling of a has a relationship between classes. And the enclosing class has a copy of the enclosed class. And the same, you're using the same notation as for structures within structures. So you can get at an object that's inside another object by doing object one dot object two dot whatever public function you need to do. So some examples I think of this, if I have a car class, um, I could have a member variable that represents the entertainment system. So maybe I've already made a complicated class just to represent the entertainment system in a car. So, you know, why not, why redo that? When I make my car class now, just make one of the member variables of type entertainment system. Why not you can do that? Good example of aggregation. Or maybe just kind of expand on that. Obviously, every car is going to have four tires. So maybe I would make an array of tire objects. And I've got tire objects that um, you know record the, um, the material, uh, the size, the air pressure, all that kind of stuff. And I could make an array of four tire objects as one of the members in my car class. So that happens quite a bit, right? That's what you want. You want to build with bigger pieces. You don't just wanna be thinking ints and floats all the time. So if I do have a useful object class, why not aggregate it inside the next object that I'm trying to build? So again, some people call that aggregation, some people call that composition. I'm composing objects about, out of other objects. Now here's how, what that looks like in UML. So uh, we're not gonna go into all the details here, but the book does have kind of a big example of aggregating objects like this. 
And in UML, uh, you indicate object aggregation with this diamond-shaped arrow. So what they've done here is they have, um, they have a class called Instructor that includes all the information for one instructor in a college course. And they have, I guess they're making these C strings here. They have a last name that's a C string. They have a first name. They have an office number there for the instructor. They got a constructor. They have a mutator. They have a print function. That's interesting. Uh, here's a separate class for a textbook in a college class. And again, you've got a C string for a title and the author and the publisher, probably some other stuff. And it's got a constructor. It's got a couple constructors. I see it has a copy constructor. That's good. Got a setter, got a print function. And now you're taking both of these things and now as you build a course, a college course class, here's our course class here. You can see, of course, there's a C string for the course name. The second member is of type instructor. So here's an instructor object in my course. And then the third member here is of type textbook. So here's a textbook object in my course. And of course, that includes all the stuff that's in the textbook object class. And the course has its own constructor. And I've got another print function here, I guess, to print out information in the course. But good example of aggregation is I wanted the instructor to be a separate kind of thing. I wanted the textbook to be a separate kind of thing. Each of those need to manage quite a bit of information. So we made those separately, and then we aggregated them in the course. And yeah, object members can be other objects. Why not? And that's what that looks like in UML for what it's worth. So you can see all the details to that in chapter 14. You can run the application as a project. And um, I like that. So don't forget, you can make objects contain other objects. Aggregation or composition is what that's called. Very common. Okay, so that's the end of chapter 14. That's all the time we have for that. So I would recommend to my students, as usual, read that chapter. Test yourself with the review questions at the end of the chapter. Uh, there is a programming challenge that I assign in chapter 14 that uses overloaded operators. I love it so much. So you get to practice that a little bit with this programming challenge here. Um, and then my students would get together for this lab here. Again, we're going to continue to expand that feet inches class, which I think is very interesting. And so we would look in this case at feet inches version two in the book, read the specification. I think it's added, just like we saw in this lecture, it's added the addition operator it's added the subtraction operator. It's added prefix and postfix increments. So two separate versions of plus plus, just like we saw. So I would want to look at that, make sure we understand it, write a test driver, test all of those public functions, confirm they work like we would expect. And if we have time, then go ahead and like, why not add decrement operators, right? The minus minus. And again, that's going to have to be two separate functions. One for the prefix version, that's supposed to happen first in a line, and one for the postfix version that's supposed to happen at the end of a line. So uh, that would be a good, uh, good practice to, um, to work with both of those things. And some other things that we're thinking about, it, like how could we improve this in the future? Now, in the next video, we're going to get into chapter 15. And chapter 15 is about inheritance and polymorphism. And wow, that is just like nuclear-powered, important, big stuff in object-oriented programming. So I really hope you'll, um, you'll join me for that. Inheritance is basically take a class and then very easily make a new class that's based on it. All the stuff in the old class, you just get for free, right? Every, you just get it all for free. And then if you want to, you can add some more stuff to modify your new class and make it more specific and more specialized. So you get a lot of, you get a lot of uh, power out of inheritance and polymorphism. So one of the, two of the major crown jewels of object-oriented programming. I really hope if you're interested in object-oriented programming that you join me next time for that, for the inheritance and polymorphism discussion. So I'll see you for that.